Hello, everyone. I'm Lynn Hunsaker. Welcome to this mini webinar on driving change. As we uh, go forward, I would love to see where you're calling in from. It's always wonderful to see all the people across the world that are tuning in. And also, if you'd like to comment about what was a very uh, decisive factor in you being engaged in a change, something that, that uh, someone else was managing, but you decided to uh, put your whole heart and, and, uh, and uh, energy into it. So by driving change today, we're not talking about just uh, being, riding the waves of uh, surviving in change. We're talking about being in the driver's seat to make change happen across your enterprise. So um, managing change in a formal way is about identifying what the resistance factors are for all of your stakeholders, and also what are the engagement factors? What are the things that are really appealing to them? And so it requires us to stand in their shoes and to see things as they do, and to be proactive in minimizing the resistance and maximizing engagement. So why do we need to be driving change if we're in customer experience, customer success, customer care, uh, employee experience, partner experience, marketing? These roles are the conduit to the rest of the enterprise for insights from customers, employees, and partners for growth and innovation. And I love this study done by MIT where they looked at about uh, 10,000 um, innovations over five years. And they found that the ones that were inspired by customers' ideas had 8x revenue gain compared to the ones that were based on internal ideas. And so we have a responsibility, basically a fidu fiduciary uh, stewardship to the company to help bring the insights that we have from customers, employees, and partners, the three stakeholders that fuel an enterprise's growth into all of the uh, groups across your ecosystem and uh, make sure that they are understanding what turns them on, what turns them off, and making that the impetus for not only product design, service design, but also policies and processes, the administrative things that uh, we need to have innovated as well. Um, so customer experience, employee experience, and partner experience really are a team sport. There's only so much you can do with the customer-facing touch points. Certainly those are vital and can make or break the ongoing relationship, but even more deep-seated and even more revenue growing and cost, uh, cost growing as well is all of the other groups that are not customer facing doing their part to be proactive in getting it right the first time. So the importance of this can be seen as well through another study that I just love by London School of Economics, where they're looking at the percentage increase of revenue when you increase positive word of mouth by 1% or you decrease positive word of mouth by 1%. What they found was 3x more when you are reducing negative word of mouth. So we need to be doing a lot more in employee experience, customer experience, customer care, customer success, and marketing to reduce negative word of mouth and not just superficially. In fact, one of the most uh, influential diagrams that I, I came uh, that I've come across is this one, and it was explained to me when I started out as voice of the customer manager at uh, the last corporate role I had that customer perceptions exist. And please, as we go through this whole uh, presentation today, um, make sure that you are. Um, that you are uh, using customer experience, employee experience, and partner experience interchangeably. Whenever I say customer, you can uh, in insert or uh, replace the word with employee or partner. But perceptions exist no matter what. And we do surveys and uh, various sorts of listening, various sorts of monitoring to understand what's going on with them because they do fuel our, our growth. 
And when we can understand uh, what's driving their behaviors, it helps us to be more proactive. And so, um, unfortunately, the net promoter system, I think, has sometimes gotten us locked between just the perceptions and the customer feedback and trying to make, um, you know, adjustments there. We call that the micro loop uh, for closing, closing the loop. Um, much more needs to be done, much more ambition in the macro loop or creating real action plans that get to the root of the issue for the whole customer base, the whole employee base, the whole partner base. And that usually requires more than one group to do. It's not just one business unit or one region. It's cross-functional. And therefore, a lot of people shy away from it. They don't know how to manage that kind of change. And that's what we're talking about today. So when you create those kind of action plans that get to the real root issue and involve other parties within the, your enterprise to cross-functionally navigate the, the uh, elimination of that root cause, now you have a way to predict what customers are going to be experiencing in the near future. And so when you do a survey or any kind of monitoring, you're actually just validating what you're seeing in your change management. So again, this is a team sport. It's something that we need to be engaging every group across our company and doing. And in fact, back in the mid 1990s, before we even had, um, you know, internet, um, shared drives, you know, we, we, uh, <laughs> uh, we, I think we were working with Lotus one, two, three, my team created over 50 reports so that every group across our company, every uh, p &L and even support functions had their own cut of the survey data from our, our customer relationship survey. And I went around the world and did action plan workshops where we, we identified root causes and created action plan metrics that would be predictive of what customers were going to be experiencing. So we put this in action before we had all the bells and whistles and advantages of today. Um, so I'm still interested in um, in looking for in, in your comments, if you'd like to introduce yourself or tell me about um, tell me about uh, what was very pivotal to a change that you have experienced. So please uh, go ahead and, and uh, put those in the stream. Now, why should you in drive internal change? This is a, the uh, icing on the cake here. You're seeing that Temkin Group has been so insightful to be monitoring how many companies are mobilizing, operationalizing, aligning, or embedding customer experience across their enterprise. And you find year after year that a tremendous number are mobilizing and a very small number are operationalizing, aligning, and embedding. And this has been a trend uh, kind of static for ages, and we've got to put an end to it. In the 2020s, we need to be uh, putting our sights on the stars and hitting the moon. And um, that means you can start today to be a transformer and a collaborator, not just an analyst or a collector. <laughs> and so you can see the um, how these two charts are connected and they both come from Temkin. So thank you very much, Bruce, for all that work. And what we need to be doing is engaging our entire organizations in paying attention to the insights that we collect from whatever sources and adopting those as performance standards in their own roles. And every group can be engaged in um, understanding what's, what's making partners and employees and customers tick and making tweaks in what they do uh, so that they're preventing issues in the first place and very importantly, resolving issues that have been uh, sapping the company's resources. Um, you know, it's possible to actually make strides in 2022 and 2023 right now in the transformer and collaborator categories. I know that because I did it in my first two years way back in the mid 90s before we had all of the um, advantages that we have today. And so, um, you know, stay tuned to, to more of these 
uh, mini webinars or join any of our uh, Clear Action resources so you can learn more about that. Everything we, we do here is really driving toward transformer and collaborator stages, uh, migrating to the operationalized aligning and embedding, making experience excellence a way of life for customers, partners, and employees. So the basis for change is trust. And we talked a couple weeks ago about trust. And, um, you know, it all starts with shared interests. And I often start with what do we all believe in? You know, when I'm in a meeting with new groups, um, the company values, uh, growth objectives that the company has, um, having greater ease of work, having greater ease of doing business for partners and customers. And usually you can find common ground on any of those three dimensions. So bringing that into your introduction, into the early parts of your, your agenda, your conversation, is very important just to establish that you have a shared interest. Secondly is asking good questions, being observant about what makes the other party tick? What are their pressures? What are they rewarded by? What are the things on their hit parade, so to speak? That's what's in it for me from their viewpoint. And so identifying that early on through either observation or asking good questions is the key to creating shared understanding. So now you have a, an empathy factor in there. And that leads you to getting buy-in and creating an action plan where you have shared expectations for moving things forward. And fourth, when you are consistent in the execution in terms of rewards and penalties, having that um, clarity that people know it's reliable, what they can expect from you, this is how we cement the change happening. So. More specifically, there are seven steps in change management. And the first two are evaluate and envision. And that's where we are identifying who the, the key players are, who is affected by the change, who has a stake in it, who uh, do we rely upon to give permission or uh, be a... Um, uh, a helping hand in it in any way. The next two, analyzing and planning, are about ways, uh, pre preparing ways that we're going to reduce resistance and increase engagement. The last three, implement, review, and leverage, are done iteratively as we execute the plan. So execute the change. In evaluating, you want to look at um, what does everybody need in order to make this change happen? And by change, we could be talking about uh, implementing a technology, um, having a, a, an offsite or a, uh, you know, some kind of pinnacle meeting, or, you know, the day-to-day the -day, uh, objectives that you have for uh, gaining greater traction and customer experience, employee experience, partner experience this year. So who is really needed and how do we involve them in that shared vision. So there's quite a number of questions that you need to be asking yourself and taking some very quality time to prepare um, for each of these steps. And we're going to look at some templates in a moment that will help you with that. In the analyze phase, we're planning out how quickly we should move because we need to be cognizant of uh, people's bandwidth and ability to absorb and uh, make adjustments, the emotional aspects as well as the functional aspects. What are the, what are the, what is their readiness and what are the potential barriers and existing barriers and create backup plans for your entire uh, change that you have underway early on. Often we decide, well, let's, let's look at the backup plan when we're done because we're too busy getting things going. And um, we found through the pandemic as a really great example, it's always important to have a backup plan early on before you're overwhelmed by something, before you're too bought in. In fact, in this whole uh, series of uh, evaluating, envisioning, and analyzing, you might even be 
reassessing whether you really need this change, uh, what are do a five whys analysis for what is the real root cause behind the change needed. And sometimes you, you can find very important pivot points earlier rather than later. In planning, you're uh, figuring out what kind of messaging you need to have, uh, who, what kind of aids, uh, there might be uh, toolkits and things that you need to create, training, what are the politics surrounding this and how do we uh, be proactive in smoothing those things down, rewards and milestones, uh, having that all set up. Now, luckily, when I came into that uh, company where I, I just showed you the, the model, um, all of this had been thought through for my role as customer experience leader. And I came into it with this whole plan to create separate reports for every group, go around the company and do these workshops, every quarter collect their action plan, progress, single page strategies, publish that to the uh, C team so that they were looking at it at the same time as the operational financial books. Uh, in preparation for the analyst calls every quarter and uh, how it was going to play out in the bonus in terms of we're going to reward them for their actual action plan progress, not just the you know survey results, which we, we've kind of viewed as a little bit out of our hands. The train has left the station. We needed to manage what we were doing about it. And so I was very fortunate to come into an environment where this had been thought out in terms of What's going to work in our culture? What's going to uh, close the loop on things? What's going to keep people accountable and keep people engaged? And having that figured out before you actually start implementing is magical. Now, most people embark on change management after they have started implementing things and people are resisting, things are, are um, going off the rails, but it's never too late to go through these steps and in fact, you need to keep revisiting them over and over anyway. We did a revisit on our change management plans in my staff at least every six weeks when we you know, closed all the, the blinds in the conference room and put these uh, templates up and really thought through what, what are some of the things that are holding people back? What are some of the things that we might do to uh, move things forward? Um, in, in a very concerted way. So we were uh, engaged in mid-course adjustments and frequent reviews of what's working well, what's not working well, and then leveraging those lessons learned and taking those out to our business champions, learning from them as well. So the last three steps are iterative. Now this template here is uh, very instrumental. It's where you're going to be li listing on the left-hand side, all of your stakeholders, this could be groups, it could be certain key individuals and identifying what role you need from them. Are they a, 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 you know, a stakeholder at large? Are they actually a facilitator of the change? Are they a sponsor of the change? And then what contribution is required to make it happen, make, help it happen or let it happen? Now on the perceived costs, this is what I was talking to earlier when I mentioned that you've got to stand in their shoes and understand how they're looking at it. It may be quite different from how you're looking at it. And every stakeholder deserves to have this uh, careful thought process. What are some of the emotional factors that, that they might be striving uh, about in accepting this change? What are some of the things that where they're losing power, they're losing control or uh, maybe budget or people or it's impinging on their bandwidth? So you need to be uh, very, very uh, careful and, um, and deep in understanding people's costs. And then you can rank order them by how much that's probably impacting them and brainstorm some ways to reduce those costs. The next part is what are their perceived benefits? Now, everybody has a different outlook. And so don't just trans transfer your perceptions in this column, really do your homework where you're meeting with these people, um, whether it be just go to lunch, 
doing interviews, um, attending some of their staff meetings and such so that you can, can stand in their shoes and understand how do they view things and then ways that you can increase those benefits. And then finally, how are you going to involve them in, a share, in uh, the shared vision? Remembering that reducing the perceived costs is always going to be much more important than increasing the perceived benefits because you have to remove the pebble from people's shoe before they can run. They're never going to give you full credit for all the good until you have removed the negative. So I want to emphasize that these first four steps are very critical to, to revisit over and over again and to refine. This is the, really the heart of change management. And um, as much as you can, even six months before you plan to, to make a change or you know, as early as possible, start out on this, this process because you'll thank yourself over and over again when you have been proactive. So what is your tr trust profile? This is um, where we're looking at um, the role that people have this, this month and how we might need them to back off or move forward or stay where they're at uh, this next coming month. And so you can um, adjust uh, people's engagement as you go along. And finally, this template I found to be so useful because you're plotting the support that people have for the change across the x-axis and the impact on the change across the y-axis. And the people who are in the upper right corner are your early adopters. So you want them to help move the laggards forward. And this is a really important part of change management. It's not just you continually being on your bullhorn or cracking the whip or, you know, holding out those carrots. Uh, it's, it's really about making it a team sport in terms of the early adopters helping the laggards um, in addition to what you're doing in your staff. In managing resistance, this is the place where people usually decide, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm backing off. I'm not going to deal with those people anymore. They're just too hard. And that's a mistake. You need to continually nurture uh, every stakeholder's involvement. And so that starts off with recognizing the behavior. And sometimes you want to keep that to yourself. Sometimes you want to call it out and have a frank discussion about it. So case by case, you need to be <laughs> considering your intended outcomes and, and uh, honoring that in the way that you do it. But exploring the causes involves doing a five whys analysis. Why, why is this behavior happening? Why are we seeing the symptom? What's the root behind that? What's the root behind that? And going down to five levels. Once you have that in front of you, you can be more objective about ways that need, you need to intervene. Um, it may be things that you can do on your own. It may be things where you need to have a, a discussion or involve the other person explicitly and make sure that you're following up and, and always nurturing a positive trajectory with each stakeholder. It's always a team sport and every player is necessary. So in closing, I would like to invite you to explore more about this topic and related things that you can see here in these badges, consistency to intentions, respecting interdependencies on the far right, lifetime value mindset and aligned motivations, customer-centered action and enterprise use of insights. This applies to customer experience, employee experience and partner experience, all of the marketing organization, customer success, customer care managers. This is your place that you can come to for ongoing team uh, skill building across your team. And it's meant to be uh, very affordable and accessible so that you can pop into the value exchange throughout your day and find little resources that only take five minutes, 10 minutes, maybe up to 40 minutes for some resources, but never more than that. In finding the solutions, finding a path, being reminded of uh, key factors for success, it's all there for you, and um, it's it's uh, 
It's something that I would love to give you a demonstration of if you'd like to sign up. So in closing, experience leadership is a step beyond touchpoint management and experience management. Experience leadership is company-wide alignment to the expectations of your customers, employees, and partners as the three stakeholder groups that fuel your growth. I welcome you to join us next week as we talk about five execution silos and what you can do to influence your whole organization in smoothing silos. Uh, thanks for joining me today. And uh, I look forward to seeing you, seeing your questions and comments as we go forward. Thank you.